nights ago, I was invited to attend a fireside. Uh, it was a fireside for a gentleman who recently wrote a book called Putting on Christ, and the author's name is uh, Stephen Bishop. And uh, I believe it's his first book. Uh, it's a wonderful book. I just recently got it, just started reading it. Uh, it's just, it's such a great book to remind you of the importance of having the Savior in our life and how accepting Him and understanding His atonement can change everything. It was a wonderful evening. I really enjoyed it. I had the opportunity to actually sit next to my good friend, Brandon Mull, who um, those of you who, who know me uh, know that Brandon Mull actually helped with uh, my new book, Return from Risa. His wife, Erwin, uh, was our editor. When I say my new book, it was a book I wrote with a dear friend of mine, Richard Nelson. Anyway, it was a wonderful evening. It was great to, to be there to spend time with Brandon and kind of chat a little bit before the presentation and during a break and then after. But it was kind of fun because right before the presentation started, this lady came up to me and I'm sitting in my seat and I'm sitting on the aisle. There's kind of an aisle down the middle and I'm, I don't know where, maybe four rows back and I'm sitting on the aisle seat. And this uh, older woman comes up to me and she looks down at me and she says, are you Phil Wright? And I immediately stood and I said, uh, yes, I am. And I, I offered her my hand and I said, and who are you? And she introduced herself as Victoria. And I said, well, Victoria, it's wonderful to meet you. And she said, well, I just was excited when I noticed that you were in the audience because I wanted to tell you how much I loved your book. And I assumed she was talking about this book, Return from Risa. But she wasn't. She was talking about my first book, Now Without Mercy, The Black Death. And it kind of, it just kind of caught me off guard because, you know, when you're kind of doing a book tour for a new book, you don't expect someone to come up to you and tell you how much they liked your book when in fact it was your first book that you wrote 10 years ago. Um, but it was kind of, it, it was really fun and very humbling. Uh, here I am sitting next to Brandon Mull, who has had 18 or 19, maybe 20, number one New York Times bestselling books in the genre of fantasy fiction. If you're not familiar with Brandon, he's written things like Fable Haven, Candy Shop Wars. Actually, he's working on the third book of Candy Shop Wars. So those of you who are interested in Brandon Mull, there's a little uh, tidbit. Um, and he mentioned to me he thinks it's the last book. However, it may not be. But anyway, Brandon is such a prolific writer. He's incredible. He has such a way with describing things it just pulls you into the story and his characters are just wonderful anyway so here i am sitting next to brandon and this woman introduces herself and and asks me if i am the author phil wright and tells me how much she enjoyed my book and again it was my first book uh, and i thought to myself I, I had a nice conversation with this woman and and uh, she was asking for book two, and I said, yes, actually, there is a book two. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, book one was Not Without Mercy, The Black Death, and book two is Not Without Mercy, The Passage Home. And I told her I'd make sure that uh, I would get her book two. But anyway, so I, I sat down and I look at Brandon, and I said, Brandon, th that was amazing. A, a woman came up to me and asked if I was an author, and I'm sitting next to you. She should have been coming up to you, not me. Anyway, uh, it, it was just a wonderful experience. But as we talked about Not Without Mercy, it just brought back so many uh, wonderful memories of writing this book. And it was kind of fun because I could tell she had read the book because she was talking about William, the main character, and, and Michael. And the tragedy of what they went through. If you haven't read the book, uh, it's a story of a family that survives the Black Plague in Bristol, England in 1348. Um, and it's a very touching and heart-wrenching story. It's a historical fiction. I spent two years writing it, one year researching it, and one year writing it. And uh, 
it, it was an incredible spiritual experience for me writing it because there would be times when I would have dreams and the characters in the book would come to me and tell me things. And sometimes they would come to me late at night, I should say very early in the morning, around maybe three or four after I had just gone to bed, after finishing a chapter, writing a chapter, and they would say, no, 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 you didn't get that right, Phil. Here's how it happened. Then I would get up and rewrite the chapter. I know that might sound hokey to some of you, but oh well, it is what it is. So it was really a fun experience to talk with Victoria and uh, to see how that book influenced her life. Uh, she said she cried all the way through it. I didn't, I didn't mean it to be a tear-jerking book, but, you know, it is about a family that survives the Black Plague. And if you think about what our world has gone through in the last couple of years with COVID and how bad COVID has been, I'm telling you, COVID was nothing compared to the Black Plague. Because if you got the Black Plague, you were usually gone within three to five days. I mean, your life was over. But it was interesting, and one of the things I talked to Victoria about, I said there's a certain line in the book that just kind of came out at me when I realized how people dealt with death all around them. And, and everyone dealt with it differently. And there's a line in the book that I wrote where I said, the faithless became fearful and the faithful became fearless. And that to me is such a powerful concept that when we put our faith in God, we really do become fearless. But when we put our faith in man, and we become faithless, we really do become fearful. Now, my book, Return from Risa, is very, very different than Not Without Mercy. Um, for those of you that have read it, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those of you that have not read Return from Risa, it really is an incredible, quite amazing story about a four-year-old boy it starts in 1965 in a little town called Oroville, California, and it's the experiences this four-year-old boy has, starting at age four, I should say, where he is uh, abducted by aliens, bear with me now, and he also has experiences with angels, where angels are coming to him on a regular basis to give him strength and encouragement because of these abductions he's dealing with. And uh, as the story progresses, the little boy's name is Connor. Um, you discover that he knows who Jesus is, even though his parents are not active members of any church. His parents are Christian, but they don't go to church. And he has two older brothers and a younger sister, but yet he knows who Jesus is. And one day his mother discovers him out in the backyard uh, yelling at somebody and she steps out and realizes he's yelling at Jesus. He's kind of mad about things and the way things are going and uh, and just you know kind of like you see a little child maybe getting upset at their mom or their dad and, and yelling you know I'm packing my bags I'm leaving home and I'm never coming back. So Connor's mother discovers that he has a special connection with God and with Jesus even though she has never really taught him about God or about Jesus. So it's a wonderful story that book one takes place from about the age of four till 10 and some quite amazing and incredible things happen. Uh, we're in the process of writing book two, almost halfway through writing book two. Our goal is to have it out by the fall. <sighs> Say a prayer, wish us well. Um, but anyway, uh, it, it was just a great experience going to this fireside and meeting a reader who actually read my first book from 10 years ago. Um, and she said that she also bought Return from Rice as she went to the books, the book launch we had back in March where Michael Rush spoke. And Michael is amazing. If you haven't had a chance to see that, 
presentation. It's on my channel here. You'll just have to search for it and find it and watch it. It's incredible. And Brandon Mull also did an amazing presentation called The Maybe Table. And I have that on my channel as well. So uh, just browse a little bit on my YouTube channel and you'll find that one. It is just an amazing concept where Brandon teaches us how we have to be open-minded and we have to be willing to consider things. That's how we learn. We have to be willing to say, well, maybe that could be true. So if we, we either don't believe it or we do believe it, or maybe we'll put it on the maybe table till we can get enough information to determine yes or no. So take an opportunity and watch that. And definitely watch uh, Michael Rush's presentation that he gave at our launch party. And one more thing happened as I was at this fireside. I also had another really cool experience um, with a dear friend of mine who was at the event. Um, let's just say he had something to do with the book Visions of Glory, written by John Pontius. Um, anyway, he was sitting in front of me uh, next to another friend of mine, Ken Krogh. Ken is actually, I kind of refer to him as my publicist. He's really my friend, but uh, he was a tremendous help in getting Return from Risa published. Uh, he, he did so many incredible things and brought so many wonderful people together. But anyway, he sat next to this gentleman who turned around and said, Phil, um, so-and-so, another guy was sitting next to him. I've been telling him about your book, um, the one about Jesus Messiah. Remember, what was that one called? Uh, Men Against Messiah, the Sanhedrin plot against Jesus. I wrote this one uh, I wrote this one in 2018, I believe. And it's the first book I've written that is a nonfiction. It's actually a very historical, accurate book where I detail all of the members, almost all of the members of the actual Sanhedrin who participated in the illegal trial and condemnation and eventually what led to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Um, so it's kind of fun that that he asked about this book. Um, and there's actually some uh, interest. Um, a movie producer who's considering putting together a movie having another trial, a Jewish trial, about Jesus, whether or not he was a Messiah. And they're interested in possibly using my book uh, as part of a reference for that movie, if it ever happens. But anyway, one last thing. So today I was at Lowe's um, getting a few things for our basement apartment. And I'm pushing my cart down the aisle in the lumber section. And this gentleman says, uh, Phil, how you doing? And I looked around and I thought, I probably have seen this man before, but I, I just didn't recognize him. I didn't know who it was. And I put my hand out and I said, hey, it's, it's nice to see you. I'm sorry, tell me your name. And he told me his name, and I said, now your name sounds very familiar. He goes, well, I have a really common first name and a common last name. But uh, he said, I know you through politics. And uh, for those of you who don't know, I was very involved for the last 20 years in Utah politics. I've never been a politician. I've never held public office. But I was involved with the Republican Party um, on a grassroots level for the last 20 years and had some incredible experiences that uh, led me all over the country that even allowed me the opportunity to um, run with a uh, First Amendment case that we took all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. But anyway, so we're talking, I'm talking to this gentleman and, and he's talking about politics and I kind of told him that for some religious reasons I've kind of pulled away from politics. Um, and he said, yeah, I understand that. And, and then we talked a little bit about the last days. And he mentioned Michael Rush. And I said, oh, you know Michael Rush? He said, oh, I love Michael Rush. I have all his books. If you don't have all his books, you need to get them. You can find Michael Rush's books at the thelost10tribes.com and 10, the number 10. I'll put a link down here. But anyway, so we're talking. And uh, he mentions Michael Rush. And we both talked about how much we love and admire Michael Rush and the incredible books that he writes. 
and a couple minutes later, maybe 10 minutes, and this guy was about 65, his son, I'm guessing was 30-ish, comes up, and he says, oh, you're Phil Wright. <laughs> and I said, I'm thinking politics. And I said, yes, and, you're, and you are, and I pulled my hand out and he introduced himself. And he said, oh, I just got your book. And I said, oh, which book? And it was Return from Risa. And uh, it was just kind of fun. Look, I, I'm not a celebrity. I, I've written a few books. I'm just a local guy. I, I live in Utah. Um, but it was kind of fun that within a couple of days, someone actually recognized me. Of course, with this white hair, it's kind of hard to be incognito anywhere I go. But it was fun to speak to both of these gentlemen, and then we got into a discussion about prophecies and the end of days, and of course Michael Rush, because that's a lot of what he talks about. Anyway, I just wanted to give kind of a short little update on what's happening in my life. Um, again, uh, if you haven't had the opportunity to get a copy of Return from Risa, please do. It's a wonderful book. Uh, I have so many people that have read it now. They've read it as a family. Now, it's not necessarily a family book. It's, it's pretty intense. So I would probably recommend 12 years old or older uh, because it's intense and some parts are probably pretty scary. But it has a great message. We wrote the book to find a way to teach the plan of salvation without being preachy. And we did it by teaching the plan of salvation from the perspective of people or beings from a different planet. Um, I believe that God created worlds without number. And I would never limit his ability by saying he only put children on this world. It makes no sense that he would create worlds without number and only put his children here. So I firmly believe he's put his children throughout the universe on different worlds, probably just like Earth. And if any of those children on other worlds had the technology and the ability to visit Earth, to come here where the Son of God was born, where Jesus was born, where he lived and, and taught the gospel and, and gave us the plan of salvation and was crucified and died for our sins and resurrected, wouldn't they want to come here if they had the ability to do so just to see the promised land world? Of course they would. Now, I'm not talking about little green men or strange space creatures. I'm not sure about their existence. It's on my maybe table. I'm talking about people like you and me who also have the plan of salvation, who, if they have the technology, the ability to come here, just like you or I would want to go to the Holy Land and walk where Jesus walked, they would probably want to come here and visit the planet where the Son of God atoned for their sins and gave them the opportunity to look forward to an eternal life. That's my spiel. Thanks for watching. I hope you have a wonderful day. Whatever you might be doing, I hope your week is going well. Thank you so much for listening, and thanks for your friendship.